In this last example in the course, we're going to work through the design of a single short stub based matching network. So the scenario here is that we have a 50 ohm air core transmission line terminated in a load impedance whose value is 100 plus J50 ohms at the operational frequency of 4 gigahertz. So 50 ohms here, of course, means that's the characteristic impedance of the air core transmission line. And we want to, first of all, determine the location and length of the matching short circuit stub. And also using the Smith chart, determine, first of all, the voltage standing wave ratio on the transmission line between the load and the stub. And finally, then, the voltage reflection coefficient at the load itself. So the first thing we do is we work out the normalized load impedance, which, of course, by definition is simply the load impedance divided by the characteristic impedance of the transmission lines, which is 50 ohms. So if we do that, we get a value of 2 plus J, basically 2 plus J1. So that's the normalized load impedance. Now, because it's a parallel based matching network, we're better off working in terms of admittance. So the next thing we need to do is determine the normalized load admittance, which of course is simply the inverse of the normalized load impedance. So little yl is equal to one over zl, which is one plus one divided by two plus j. And for simple, simple complex numbers, manipulation of this inverse, we get 0 0.4 minus j 0 0.2. And we're going to label that normalized load admittance on the chart and call it point P. Now, in the course of this problem, we're using the Smith chart provided in the Microsoft Word smith.doc file. And you can get that file from Sulis in the resources section labeled transmission lines. Okay. And also in the class notes, there's quite clear instructions how you can draw points, lines, and circles in that file. So if you're doing transmission line problems, you'll be using that particular file. Before lockdown, you'll be doing all these drawing of lines and circles and so on using ruler and compass, but that's obviously not possible in this COVID situation. So, as I mentioned here, point P. Now, point P, YL basically, YL was equal to G, which is 0 0.4, plus JB, and B was equal to minus 0 0.2. So, how do we get that point in the chart? Well, it's the intersection of the G equal to 0 0.4 circle with the B equal to minus 0 0.2 circle. Now, B is negative here. So that means we're on the lower half of the chart. So we go to the chart, we find the G equal to 0.4 circle, there it is in fact. And then we also find the B equal to 0.2 circle on the bottom of the chart. So that's it here, 0.2. And the intersection of that G equal to 0.4 circle with the B equal to effectively minus 0.2 circle Labelled 0.2 in the bottom half of the plane is the point P. So there it is, point P. And that can be done in that document, that smith.doc document. So to indicate a point within that Word file, use one of the points that I've actually provided in the document itself. There's little small few circles. And there's also little text boxes in there too you can use. Now, the next step is to basically move that load admittance point corresponding, of course, to the load actual admittance and move that point P in a direction towards the load, or rather towards the generator, apologies, which, of course, on the Smith chart is in the clockwise direction. We're moving it on a constant mod gamma circle until we intersect the G equal to one circle, circle, which of course is the locus effectively of YM, the normalized admittance 
looking towards the load just to the right hand side of the interface between the stub and the main transmission line. And once we get that intersection point with G to one circle, then we can read off in the Smith chart the actual value of the susceptance BN of this normalized admittance YN. So here we have it. So that's point P. And then what you do is you draw as best as possible in the smith.doc file a circle. You need to practice that yourselves. That's centered at the center of the chart. And then once you've done that, you can imagine then rotating that point P going in the clockwise direction. So that's towards the generator until we intersect the G equal to one circle, which in this example is this point here. And of course, on that G equal to one circle, then we've located the point YN, this guy here that we desire. And then to find out the associated value of BM, we find out the closest B circle to that point. Now we're on the top half of the plane here. So the B closest B circle to that point actually has a value of one. Now in practice, you would try and find a, the closest B circle or a reasonable estimate to the B circle at that point. In any case here, it's a nice value of equal to 1.0. Now, in fact, there's actually two solutions here. You could also use this intersection point down here, but that's further away in terms of actual movement, physical movement on a real transmission line. But in fact, there's actually two solutions here. Okay, so that's um, YM, this unique value, and we have BM. Now, the next step then is simply from the Smith chart to find out the location of that stub, essentially the distance D from the actual load impedance. So first of all, there's BM equal to one. And back to determining D then. Well, that's very, very simple. We simply first of all draw a line from the center of the chart through point P directly outwards. And we do the same thing for point Q, directly outwards, exactly. And then, of course, to get that distance between point P and point Q in terms of wavelengths on the transmission line, then we can simply use either the wavelengths towards generator scale or the wavelengths towards the load scale. It doesn't matter which, as long as you're very careful in how you read the associated values of lambda because remember both of those scales start off here having a value of zero the wave and source generator of course is going in the clockwise direction and the wavelength towards the load is going in the anti-clockwise direction but they both start off here so we can find d by determining that distance in terms of wavelengths between the two points by using one of the wavelength scales but as I said, be careful how you use the scale to ensure that you get the correct distance. Now, in this case here, we get a value of 0.2 lambda, approximately. Now, of course, later on, we'll actually have to work out the value of lambda to get the physical distance required. Now that we've completed the first part of the problem, which is determining the location of the stub, in terms of its distance from the load. Next, we need to concentrate on the stub itself. Now we're using a short circuit stub here. And basically we want to find out what is the value of the stub length L required such that the normalized admittance looking into the stub, which I just call Ys, is equal to minus J times Bn. That's just the same as saying that the normalized susceptance looking into the stub is equal to minus BM. Now we got previously that BM was equal to plus one. So that means we require that the normalized susceptance looking into the stub is equal to a value of minus one. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, we locate the location on the Smith chart of the short circuit load. Now, short circuit, in terms of admittance, has a 
admittance of infinity. So basically g equals infinity. And of course that g equals infinity is simply on the Smith chart a point which in fact is the one zero point on the chart. This point over here. So that point here represents in terms of what we're doing here the short circuit load point g equal to infinity. Now then what we do next is we basically move that point in the clockwise direction because we're moving away from the short circuit load and we do so on the chart until we meet the B in this case equal to minus one circle. So imagine continuing along here we do that and then in fact we reach here B equal to one on the chart written but of course we're on the bottom half of the plane so we take that B value to, to be negative so minus one effectively. And then of course we can simply extrapolate out here if need be to the appropriate wavelength scale whichever one is convenient and then that distance between the short circuit point load point and the b in this case equal to minus one circle that's the distance l in terms of wavelengths and we get here a length equal to 0.125 lambda so in fact the smith chart is quite accurate quite accurate in practice so 0.125 lambda so that's essentially that part of the problem solved. Uh, so it's intrinsically quite easy. Now, don't forget, of course, that on a short circuit terminated and also on an open circuit terminated transmission line, the magnitude of a reflection coefficient all along here is equal to one. So of course, then what is the standing wave ratio on that line? The standing wave ratio, voltage standing wave ratio that is, is actually infinite okay because remember s the voltage standing wave ratio is equal to one plus mod gamma over one minus mod gamma so the magnitude of reflection coefficient on a short circuit or open circuit terminated transmission line is equal to one and the associated bswr is equal to infinity Now what we need to do next then of course is calculate the physical lengths. Now we're only dealing here with an air core transmission line. So the wavelength is simply C divided by F, speed of light in free space divided by the frequency. We put in the numbers that were given. So the speed of light is 3 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. The frequency is 4 gigahertz, so 4 by 10 to the power of 9. And when we stick in the numbers we get a value for lambda of 75 millimeters. In which case then it's easy to calculate D and L and we get lengths of 15 millimetres and 9.4 millimetres respectively. So they're quite short lengths and very easy to implement on, for example, a printed circuit board or microstrip line. Very, very simple. So that's the design of the impedance mass network complete. If one was to do all of this using equations, on a piece of paper, for example, it certainly wouldn't be a trivial exercise. Now that said, there are lots of very sophisticated software packages now for microwave circuit design. And such circuit design also includes, of course, the design of impedance mesh networks. Uh, some of the software actually is very, very expensive. You'd be talking about tens of thousands of euro a year for a single license. Okay, we'll move on to the next two parts of the problem which are concerned with the VSWR and also with the reflection coefficient at the load. We move on now then to the next part of the problem was to determine the VSWR on the transmission line between the stub and the load impedance. So how we can do this is simply use the previous mod gamma circle that we drew for through the load here it is here and we simply find out where that constant mod gamma circle intersects for example the positive real axis which is over here that's what this intersection is 
And then we find out the closest R circle to that point. And over here in that positive real axis, the R circle closest to that point is approximately 2.6. And that indeed is the VSWR on the line between the load and the stub, not anywhere else. We could have also used this point over here, which in fact could give a more accurate result quite often in practice. Read off the closest R circle to that point and take its inverse, and that would give us the VSWR as well. So now that we have the VSWRS, and what we're doing here is to get the magnitude of the associated reflection coefficient. We care about the reflection coefficient at the load impedance, so we'll explicitly call that modulus of gamma L. Now, of course, the magnitude of that reflection coefficient is the same everywhere on the transmission line between the stub and the load impedance. And just by using the simple formula that we had in the notes and sticking in the numbers, we get a value of 0.44. And then finally, what we want to find out is, we want to find out the angle of the reflection coefficient at the load impedance. So to do that, we simply draw a line from point P through the center of the chart and continue outwards until we intersect the voltage reflection coefficient scale. And then we read off an estimate of the angle at that intersection point. And if we do that in the chart, we get an angle of approximately, and we'll say equal to 27 degrees. We expect it to be positive, of course, because we're in the top half of the plane. So that's what we want. We want the magnitude of the load reflection coefficient and its angle. And those two parameters entirely specify in polar form the load reflection or voltage reflection coefficient. And that's basically the course finished. So that's all folks. And uh, I hope you haven't found the course too onerous. And there is a lot of theoretical material in this course. And, but nonetheless, electromagnetics really forms the foundation of almost all classical electronic and electrical engineering. So it's important material, especially for high frequency circuit design, communication systems, but also it has a certain beauty all of its own.